Japan, Japan campus. Uh, this is uh, a very timely topic. Can you hear us, Paul? Yes. Okay. Um, we're going to discuss Japan's energy policy in the aftermath of the 311 quake and the Fukushima problems, to use an understatement. Um, and uh, Paul Scalise uh, needs no introduction. As you know, he is a ICAST fellow. He was for a long time an equity research analyst in Tokyo, focusing on the Japanese electricity industry. He then obtained his doctorate at Oxford University, again focusing on the Japanese electricity market. So he's really, for more than 10 years, been a Mr. Japanese Electricity. Uh, and uh, he's kindly agreed uh, to give a presentation at Temple. You have uh, the, the PowerPoint is on the screen. You also have a printout in case you find it difficult to see the screen. Uh, and we will put uh, this presentation on our website uh, on a video link as well um, in the next few days. Uh, just a, a word of introduction. Uh, if you did not uh, get an invitation directly from us, uh, just uh, send us an email. Uh, or uh, give me your business card, and there's a, we have a box over there for business cards. And also, if you want to contribute to our programs, there's a donation box, which doesn't accept ballot, uh, ballots, but does accept cash. Uh, and um, again, we thank you. So I think uh, we, we've reached the time. So Paul, uh, probably speak for about half, half an hour, something like this, and then we'll take Q&As. So the floor is yours, Paul. Okay, well, well, thank you, Robert. Uh, I suppose I should start by asking if everyone can hear me all right. Yes. Okay. Well, um, I guess, yes, good evening. Um, it's uh, 6.30 in the morning in beautiful Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm at the uh, Temple University campus. It's uh, my second time here. It's a very beautiful place. Um, I envy anyone who goes here to this university. Um, I uh, suppose I should start uh, with uh, just a general thought. Uh, as I was uh, preparing for this um, talk, one of the things that occurred to me was the simple fact that uh, the coverage on uh, both television and in the, the media for, for lack of a, a better word, seems to be focused almost entirely nowadays uh, on the nuclear crisis. I was wondering for a while why that was, considering the, the overall tragedy, the, the amount of property loss and damage uh, for the longest while. And uh, one of the things that occurred to me, uh, possibly, was that uh, people have a, have a tendency to think that the, the uncertain is far scarier than what we do know. Uh, and uh, when I was thinking about this over the past few, few weeks and watching the coverage, um, I began to think about what would happen if the lights were to go off in Tokyo, and how tenuous it is uh, that we have a hold on our own civilization when uh, survival becomes an issue. And what, all, what do we do, in fact, when the lights do go out and stay out for several hours or indeed for, for several days? Um, and is this the reason why we are, I guess, partially terrified uh, about the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear crisis, nuclear crisis. Uh, uh, and the possible looming electricity crisis. Is this the reason why we pay so much attention to it? And I'm beginning to, to believe that it, it's true, uh, that uh, this is the reason that we're so fascinated with it. It's the uncertainty of it all. Um, and so in addressing this uncertainty, I thought it would be useful if we could actually go through um, some of the key issues um, that uh, will uh, most certainly be at stake uh, not only 
uh, over the next few months, but perhaps for the next few years. Uh, and I've uh, taken the liberty of dividing those issues into uh, four categories, uh, four categories of risk, in fact. An operational risk, which includes the infrastructure, the geography, and the overall security, um, not only for the electric power companies, but also for um, the stability of the fuel supply and the governance was the government's response to that um, natural disaster. Then there is the uh, larger commercial and economic risk, which includes policy decisions in response to those operational problems. Uh, those include policy decisions and external shocks and regulations and so forth, uh, followed by the response from society, the societal risk. And those include changes in, in social and labor structures and the very behaviors that we've come to take uh, for granted over large periods of time, including labor management relations, uh, U.S.-Japan international relations, uh, the uh, reputational and social risks and responsibilities, and, and the general electorate's attitudes towards uh, energy itself and the types of energy that uh, are available to us today. And finally, there's political risk, uh, not only in uh, terms of the current regime of the Khan cabinet's Democratic Party of Japan, but also larger political issues that deal with the stability of the fuel supply, of the, of the, of the pol politicians' attitudes towards various power sources, the regulatory actions that are available to us, um, and the overall reputation of, uh, of, uh, the, of the country itself in terms of foreign direct investment, and whether or not uh, foreigners and, foreigner, uh, and foreign hedge funds uh, and foreign institutional investors feel that uh, Japan is, uh, for lack of a better word, safe, safe to invest in politically. So I want to quickly go through these, hopefully within the next uh, 30 minutes, as best I can. And uh, I'll start with operational risk uh, and discuss uh, what I like to call Japan's looming electricity crisis. Now, the conventional wisdom would have you believe that the Great East Japan earthquake of March 11th uh, should be nothing more than a blip on the radar screen. That is to say that if we were to look at past earthquakes, uh, for example, the 1995 Kobe earthquake as a point of comparison, uh, it's certainly true that uh, this earthquake was higher in magnitude. Uh, the Kobe earthquake was 7.3 versus uh, 8.9, rounding up 9.0 for this current earthquake. And no one denies, of course, the loss of life and property damage is much, much higher in 2011 than we had in 1995. However, the conventional wisdom would argue that this is uh, largely irrelevant to Japan's growth and future prosperity simply because it was focused in three prefectures, the prefectures of Iwate, Fukushima, and Miyagi. Uh, prefectures which contribute only roughly 5% to national GDP and therefore are blip on the screen. However, there is a growing concern among another subset of economists, including energy economists, which look at uh, a different picture. And if you turn to slide six, that happens to be the extent of the infrastructure damage uh, and repair not only related to the uh, destroyed uh, generation transmission and distribution systems which are slowly but surely coming back online, but also the damage that can result as a result of uh, the NIMBY politics, the nuclear politics, the not in my backyard politics that are currently taking hold. As you can see from the chart, the two companies which are in question here that were greatly affected by the earthquake of uh, March 11th were Tohoku Electric Power Corporation, located in the north, which spans some 30,708 square miles uh, with seven prefectures, 
more than uh, 7 million customers in total, 6.7 million residential customers, and over 900,000 industrial customers, contributing roughly 8% of Japan's national GDP. And of course, then there's the greater concern, which is Tokyo Electric Power Corporation, otherwise known as TEPCO, which has uh, eight prefectures in its service region and services 26.4 million residential customers and 2.1 million industrial customers, spanning 15,254 square miles. It's here that's the real issue. The percentage of GDP here for TEPCO service region is approximately 36% of Japan's GDP. So the concern is, what happens if TEPCO is incapable of keeping the lights on? So that's one of the issues which were slowly coming to light after March 11. Now, TEPCO, for probably 50 years, if not longer, had a, a somewhat impressive uh, reputation in terms of blackout risk. Uh, yes, there were blackouts, but they were relatively few and modest uh, compared to other countries. In fact, it was Japan's lack of blackout risk, which was largely uh, one of the most uh, prominent reasons that customers were so unwilling to switch over uh, after uh, the liberalization of the Japanese electricity market in March 2000. Uh, the question we should ask ourselves now is, as we approach the peak load summer months of July and August, what happens to both TEPCO's brand image, uh, as well as the overall image of the electric power companies in Japan, should the lights not only go out, but stay out for extended periods of time? What will this impact have both on their political reputation as well as the economy overall. Uh, this, this gives you a very quick overview of what it looked like uh, as a snapshot in time. Uh, it's actually changed uh, since I've done this chart, but uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see the total installed capacities of Tokyo Electric Power and Tohoku uh, before the earthquake in March 11. TEPCO had a total installed capacity of approximately 62, 63 uh, thousand megawatts. Uh, Tohoku, in turn, had a total installed capacity of roughly 16,000 megawatts. After the earthquake, uh, 13 of TEPCO's 17 nuclear reactors were offline. That's a total installed capacity uh, taken offline of about 12.3 uh, gigawatts. Some of it, of course, was due to uh, the damage of the nuclear crisis at Fukushima Daiichi uh, involving the six reactors there, but also the reactors uh, that were taken offline as a security precaution at Fukushima Daini. Uh, as well as those that were already offline as a result of mandatory uh, uh, inspections at Kashiwazaki Kariwa. In Tohoku as well, um, their two reactors were taken offline, uh, and they have stayed offline. Uh, this should not be surprising to anyone, considering that the uh, every time there is a nuclear scandal of some sort, uh, both the local communities and the regulator uh, insist that uh, extensive precautions are taken in order to protect against uh, possible hazardous effects. Uh, in the case of the 2007 earthquake uh, that took place off the uh, sea of, of the, uh, the uh, western coast of Japan, in the Sea of Japan, the Chuetsu earthquake, the uh, the fact that there was no damage whatsoever to Kashiwazaki Kariwa uh, did not stop them from doing extensive tests that lasted for over 16 months. Uh, I have no reason to believe that that will not repeat itself here. Uh, as for the larger pressure then of doing something about the conventional thermal power, that's what we are uh, uh, 
uh, that's what TEPCO and TOHOKU are essentially shooting for, doing something about uh, bringing back online the conventional power. But in this case, uh, they face a number of uh, obstacles. Um, the first obstacle is the slow build that takes place in Japan because of the regulatory structure. Now, um, part of this is <clears throat> a simple problem of uh, forecasting improperly demand, which should not surprise anyone considering how uh, it is very difficult to figure out what is happening with millions of Tokyoites uh, during the summer months when they will and will not use air conditioners, not to mention uh, when you can and cannot accurately forecast a heat wave. But the other more troubling issue is this, the supply. And what you're seeing in this chart is a historical overview of TEPCO's uh, reserve margin. Now, a reserve margin is simply the difference uh, between uh, installed capacity that is available and peak demand taken as a percentage. And what you can see over time, uh, if I can actually just uh, point to it, is you, you see uh, a somewhat uh, downward trend. I don't know if you can see the green arrow, but generally there has been a downward trend since about 1980 uh, in terms of the reserve margin. Now, economists will say that the optimal reserve margin is within the uh, 15 to 20 percent range. So technically, uh, a very safe reserve margin should be hovering around this area here, between this band. But that's not what we actually see. What we do see is that the reserve margins continue to get lower and lower and lower and lower. These spikes are actually uh, winter demand versus summer. So the summer demand keeps getting lower and lower until finally in 2007, we hit about 1.7%, which was dangerously low. Uh, the question is, what do we do now that uh, supply is uh, somewhat disabled, not only because of nuclear, but also because of the damaged uh, conventional power? The, cur the current uh, plants that are offline, uh, according to TEPCO's press statements, uh, are Hirono's number Hirono thermal power plant numbers two and four. That's the official uh, comment. Uh, whether or not that is the accurate comment uh, is unknown. What we do know is they are forecasting around the area of uh, a three uh, gigawatt gap for July and August, with demand around 55, mega, uh, 55 uh, megawatts. So where does that leave us? Some have argued that um, some have argued that um, the other companies can help, but uh, as you probably have heard over uh, many months, Japan has somewhat of a unique system where the country is divided into two frequency systems. There is the uh, 60 hertz system, which is on the uh, western Japan side, uh, where companies such as Hokuriku, Kansai Electric, Chubu, Shikoku, Chugoku, Kyushu, and of course Okinawa um, use the 60 hertz system. And on the 50 hertz system is just three companies, Hokkaido, Tohoku, and TEPCO. Because Tohoku is facing their own demand problems, they cannot really rely on purchase power sufficiently for TEPCO's own uh, power needs. And in the case of Chubu, they can only uh, at any one point purchase about uh, a thousand megawatts. So that will not suffice. This has put an enormous amount of pressure on TEPCO to either turn to self generators and purchase uh, generators from industry, uh, turn to new entrants uh, to pick up the slack, which would be very difficult considering Japan is a liberalized market. And there is the fear that they would lose their customers or uh, overcome the environmental regulations. Now, uh, as it so happens, the Ministry of Environment has agreed uh, to uh, force to uh, give TEPCO an exemption um, for any of the uh, thermal power plants that it intends to build 
rather quickly uh, over the next few uh, uh, months. Uh, normally, <clears throat> they have to do several environmental impact studies, which take at least three years. Uh, the Ministry of Environment has issued a statement saying that TEPCO no longer has to do these environmental impact studies uh, because national security and blackouts are far more important than environmental concerns at this time. Uh, and I think that speaks volumes, actually, at uh, the political priorities that are currently in place. Will this be enough? Well, it depends really on, obviously, where demand will be uh, over the next uh, uh, few months. There is a worst case, base case, and best case scenario. TEPCO is shooting for the best case scenario. Um, they uh, have already argued uh, that uh, most of their power plants that were damaged in the earthquake uh, will be brought back online. If you don't know number three, Kashima uh, numbers two, three, five, and six, uh, they will uh, restore mothballed power plants, meaning those which were uh, damaged by the, uh, 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 which were retired from service, as well as buying uh, new uh, plants and uh, having other plants that will come back from inspection. Actually, as you can see, uh, it's the plants that are currently under inspection which will make up a large portion of the, the uh, supply-demand imbalance. And that's basically what they're bargaining for. Uh, Tokyo Shoko Research reports that blackout failure continues to be a, a problem for companies wishing to uh, uh, continue uh, in their capacity and build uh, not only manufacturing companies, but also breweries, semiconductors, uh, uh, companies that make various uh, uh, components. Will this get? Uh, will this improve? Well, so far there is every indication that it, the, the situation is improving. Um, but uh, when the blackouts in uh, July and August take place, it's unclear uh, how much this will impact GDP moving forward. There have been estimates by Barclays saying that we could see, uh, and I'll, we'll discuss this later, uh, the economic impact into the billions of yen. Uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. Right now, um, this is just a, a small taste of where blackout failures were on the, the list of, of uh, problems stemming from the earthquake. And of course, there's societal risk. Uh, what civil unrest, why there's rarely any civil unrest. I, I have my own uh, theories as to why this happens. Uh, in terms of management labor relations, uh, you rarely see any strikes happen uh, in Japan, especially in the electric power companies, uh, simply because they are paid more than uh, the manufacturing sectors and uh, uh, retail sectors. Uh, these are, in economics, referred to as efficiency wages, the idea that if we pay you more, you will work harder, uh, not strike, avoid shirking, and basically be uh, and stay loyal to the company. TEPCO has done this uh, effectively since the 1970s, uh, which has actually seen a dramatic decline in uh, the overall annual strikes for the company, um, as well as maintaining a, a lifetime employment system, which is somewhat characteristic of uh, the entire Federation of Electric Power Companies of Japan. But most importantly, it is this, I believe, idea of stability itself, this media image of stability in Japan. The electric power companies were quite clever uh, when liberalization began in the 1990s uh, at the wholesale level and then uh, the retail level in 2000 and 2005 to argue that you really did not need to switch over to any new entrants, new entrants like Enron Japan, or to Diamond Power, or to Enet, uh, or even to Marubeni, simply because, um, in a word, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. Yes, electricity prices are high, but you are paying high prices as a result of the fact the lights never go out. Stability is the name of the game. 
our brand name is what matters. What happens now if the lights go out? Will there be unrest? Will there be a problem? Will Japan's relatively safe country uh, change as a result of lights being out? And no one can really answer this, though it is something that people should start to think about. And I think it's this political pressure, this idea that we have to do something quickly and uh, in the name of national security, do it uh, right away, uh, or we face uh, spillover effects that are more than just economic, they spill over into society itself. Uh, and so there's an enormous amount of pressure on TEPCO and the other power companies <clears throat> to cut deals and resolve the situation before July. Now that leads to commercial and economic risk. Uh, what can TEPCO do in order to uh, avoid this situation? Now, what you, what you have here is no secret in terms of TEPCO's uh, share price. TEPCO's share price has been falling now um, since the 1980s. Uh, it peaked in uh, around 1984, 1985, and has been falling ever since. The only time TEPCO ever does or outperforms the market is in turn is when uh, there is a, essentially a recession in Japan. These gray bars are periods of recession, and as you can see, the the uh, stock price actually does well because it is known as a defensive stock. It is a stock that pays stable earnings and dividends as if it were a semi bond. The uh, image slightly began to change after deregulation because it was believed that TEPCO would diversify its asset base and its business model in order to uh, be more competitive, uh, increase dividend payouts, increase its, uh, its uh, efficient structure, uh, and the market bought into that and the share price began to rise again. Obviously now the stock has collapsed by more than 80% uh, since March 11. Uh, the question is, uh, is this company facing nationalization? Is it facing bankruptcy uh, or neither? Um, there have been some comparisons, perhaps unjustified, to the situation that happened in Enron, where within a matter of uh, a year, Enron's share price, which uh, peaked at around $89 or $90 a share, uh, collapsed to virtually uh, nothing by 2001 and of course declared bankruptcy. Uh, I get many calls asking me is TEPCO facing bankruptcy. My answer usually says well it depends on whether the government will adopt the same argument that the United States government in particular US Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson adopted in terms of too big to fail. Is TEPCO too big to fail? Uh, and how do we determine that? Well, there are things that you have to look at in terms of both operating risks and cash flow and the regulatory options and public opinion to see what will happen. But uh, one thing is, is very certain right now, TEPCO, unlike other companies, cannot rely on other businesses. Uh, as you can see, since uh, deregulation began, the company has essentially most of its uh, sales deriving from electricity, uh, approximately uh, 90, 93 percent or so, and will continue to have most of its profits around 88 to 90 percent come from electricity, not to mention most of its assets are in electricity. Everything else has been declining in both profitability uh, and assets over the past few years, and the return on assets are very poor. Uh, there's reason to believe, perhaps uh, sooner rather than later, that their overseas businesses will also be canceled as a result of um, the nuclear crisis, as TEPCO needs to shore up uh, monies and, and uh, funding and financing for its electricity business. Therefore, uh, in order to determine whether or not TEPCO faces any problems uh, moving forward, one has to look at cash flow. Now, uh, TEPCO is, as you can see, TEPCO has been facing uh, declining generated cash flow now since 2001. Uh, part of the problem uh, has been fuel prices. Uh, part of the problem has been sluggish demand. 
for electricity. Part of the problem has been uh, trying or at least attempting to lower electricity prices. Uh, but just generally as well, um, extraordinary losses that the company had to take in 2007 as a result of the 2007 earthquake. So I thought this would rather be instructive to see what the impact was for just a very minor earthquake in 2007 and what it did to the company and what you would expect for something that is monumentally much greater uh, now. Uh, TEPCO uh, was essentially saved from uh, bankruptcy thanks to uh, an enormous amount of borrowing that allowed it to continue to pay out dividends uh, and continue uh, investing into its business. Uh, the level of extraordinary non-consolidated losses now are so great moving forward with estimates ranging from either 4 trillion yen, which is the low side, to as high as 10 trillion yen, um, that the company uh, cannot possibly sustain itself now without borrowing. And uh, the 2 trillion that it's received from the banks uh, obviously will run out very quickly. Uh, moving forward, most analysts are trying to determine what can be done uh, and how much the government will uh, play a role in the, uh, we'll call it, the bailout of TEPCO. Um, there was some talk that TEPCO would see uh, the government financing them 50-50 uh, for the uh, uh, nuclear crisis-related costs all stemming from the law uh, on the compensation of nuclear power damage. In particular, uh, two articles come to mind. Article 3.1, which is quite controversial, uh, which uh, reads that all utility companies are liable, strictly liable, for all nuclear power uh, accidents, except in instances of a great natural disaster or societal or social unrest. Uh, TEPCO's lawyers uh, have suggested, and management has also suggested, both in press conferences and elsewhere, that perhaps 3.1 is a plausible uh, exemption to the rule. Whether they will win or not uh, remains to be decided, perhaps in the uh, back rooms of uh, both Kasumi Gaseki and Nagata Cho. We don't really know yet. But another article, Article 16, uh, essentially says that once insurance money is run out uh, in the insurance of, of uh, the nuclear power plants, then the government, if TEPCO cannot actually fund itself, um, then the government must step in. Now, uh, TEPCO has found it very difficult to put new corporate bonds, which it currently has about 8% of the total corporate bond market, uh, reissued back out onto the market. They found it very difficult, especially after the downgrading from Moody's and S&P and, and other bond rating agencies, uh, making it very difficult. Their rates right now are an estimated about 1.8%, 2% and rising. Uh, if, the, if their rates are to go up, it would make it very difficult moving forward to service that and try to rebuild at the same time. This obviously has not escaped the attention of the government. Uh, which is currently trying to cut a deal, uh, and negotiations continue. Unfortunately, it's very politically unpopular at the moment. One option uh, that is often touted is that TEPCO will simply raise electricity rates. Now, uh, what you're looking at here is uh, from the International Energy Agency, which is looking at electricity prices uh, in cents per kilowatt hour. Now, electricity prices, uh, it's not really advisable to look at electricity prices with exchange rates because exchange rates fluctuate and therefore the, the uh, electricity price itself uh, is not really captured. But uh, just for a quick demonstration, even today after uh, 11 years uh, or so of uh, liberalization of the market, Japan's electricity prices remain high, both at the residential level uh, as well as the industrial level, compared to the UK, for example, the United States, especially uh, France and even Korea. Uh, TEPCO has argued, uh, perhaps suggests would be a, a better word, that uh, if 
the company is to even just break even, they would have to raise electricity prices by at least 16 uh, percent for the next fiscal year. Uh, I have looked at it myself with my financial models, and I don't see how that's even possible. Uh, it most likely would have to raise electricity prices by 25 percent uh, to break even. Uh, but of course, that depends largely on how many or how much the extraordinary losses will be in any given year uh, post-tax, and we, we simply uh, pre-tax, and we simply don't know that right now. Uh, they've already uh, taken a, a monumental loss uh, for fiscal year 2010. Will the public uh, welcome uh, uh, electricity price hike of anywhere between 16 and 25 percent? Well, given the fact that fuel cost prices will also be raising electricity prices moving forward because the price of oil is going up and the price of LNG and the price of coal on the world spot market is going up, uh, this is simply going to contribute to your electricity bills going up. Uh, when I lived in Tokyo, I was paying about uh, 50,000 yen a month uh, in the months of July and August for my electricity bill. I was paying at about 23 yen per kilowatt hour through TEPCO. Uh, the bill was horrendously high because we had the air conditioners constantly on, uh, computers were constantly on. I can only imagine what it would be today if they decided to raise the price by 25 percent. It would be astronomically huge. <coughs> Government has argued that you need to conserve power moving forward and people have made a big deal of this thinking perhaps justifiably, that the Japanese people are so civic-minded that they will comply and they will not use electricity and air conditioning as much over the summer. Will that happen? Your guess is as good as mine. But one thing is for certain. If the air conditioners stay on uh, and pr electricity prices are not allowed to go up in order to cover their costs, uh, that will put continually pressure on TEPCO's bottom line uh, and their solvency. Foreigners uh, were one of the largest shareholders uh, in TEPCO. Uh, you can see the increase over the years. They are also one of the largest volume traders today. Uh, they are mostly selling. Uh, the, electric, the share price is often a good indication of what the market thinks TEPCO is not only worth, but whether or not uh, TEPCO can survive. And with an 80% drop in TEPCO share price, the next question becomes, uh, does the market think that TEPCO is facing bankruptcy? Uh, I don't think so, because over the past uh, month, the price has essentially stabilized. Yeah, sorry. Uh, just, uh, we, we, there'll be lots of questions, so if you could probably uh, go fairly quickly for the last slide. Sure, okay. Well, we'll skip that. Um, just very quickly, um, in terms, of, in terms of policy, there are 54 reactors that are currently in opera, uh, are operation around Japan uh, in 13 prefectures. Uh, you can see from the chart that uh, many of them are offline right now. Uh, the construction projects have been suspended in Aomori uh, and Chugoku, uh, and I think it's a very good indication, leading indicator, as to whether or not they'll come online over the next two years. That'll give you a sense for whether or not Prime Minister Khan is serious about changing his national energy uh, policy for nuclear. What is uh, true is that the economics for uh, nuclear continues to be competitive. Uh, that's the blue line here relative to the red line for thermal and the black line for hydro, which is one of the reasons why nuclear was often uh, touted as being the, the answer to Japan's uh, viability uh, energy security needs. Unfortunately, what you also know is that as a result of NIMBY and uh, local opposition, uh, among other things, the cost per kilowatt of nuclear power construction has gone up over the years. Um, some tout renewable energy as the answer to this, but once again, um, there are several problems. The uh, 2010 plan was to uh, raise renewables from its current uh, uh, 9 percent, 8 percent being hydro and 1 percent being uh, uh, solar, wind, uh, biofuels, etc., um, to, to over 20 percent. But uh, once again, there, there happens to be an issue about whether or not uh, 
this is feasible by 2030. The original plan was to uh, raise nuclear as well to 50 percent. Uh, the economics for renewables right now is currently not doable. Um, but uh, if oil and uh, fossil fuel prices continue to rise, uh, it's possible that uh, a larger share can, can be made up. But we can discuss that in more detail um, moving forward. Um, at best, uh, you will see uh, more off-grid uh, increases in solar power than you probably will see in on-grid increases of uh, alternative energy, even with a feed-in tariff. Um, for a, a variety of reasons. We can get to that later. Um, uh, which finally brings us to the political stability of the, the DPJ. Um, it's kind of ironic that the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan is more popular in the electorate pollings of the Nikkei Shimbun than DPJ is right now. Khan's lack of leadership is one of the main reasons uh, why people seem to feel that uh, the DPJ has not really delivered on much of their, their, pro their uh, promises. Uh, and I suspect strongly uh, that uh, Prime Minister Khan's rhetoric regarding uh, change in nuclear power policy, as well as Japan's national energy policy, is closely tied to his poll ratings. Uh, and. Uh, we once again we will find out within the next two years how serious uh, both the the current con cabinet and the DPJ overall is towards national energy policy if these two power plants are allowed to go online. So just to tie up in conclusion, um, it's very possible that the conventional wisdom is wrong that uh, if blackouts uh, continue uh, in the summer, uh, if not longer, it will have uh, an impact on GDP. Uh, how much that will cost uh, remains to be seen. Barclays Capital had estimated that it could be anywhere between 65 and 125 billion dollars in 2011 alone. Uh, the industries impacted will obviously be energy intensive industries, mining, storage facilities, railways, chemical companies especially, breweries like Asahi breweries, computer chips and autos. Um, quarterly GDP figures are already being revised down. I believe right now TEPCO's bankruptcy risk is minimal as a result of the government stepping in uh, to calm both the market as well as encourage banks to lend to TEPCO. But we should expect deteriorating returns both in terms of profitability uh, and cash flow for the next five years. Uh, prices will rise. How high? Uh, at least 10 percent, most likely uh, as high as 15 to 20 percent over the next few years. Uh, nuclear power, in my opinion, will remain stable of what we have, uh, and re renewables will achieve marginal uh, growth as a result of both the economics as well as the technological problems associated with them uh, in the short to medium term. Uh, and I'd just like to conclude with the idea that Japan and Japan's problems will not be decided unilaterally by the Khan cabinet. They will be decided in committee which has historically been the case. Uh, and that's basically, uh, I run over, I'm sorry about that, but uh, uh, that's uh, the presentation in a nutshell. Well, Paul, thanks a lot. Uh, we will now uh, take questions and I will ask uh, the, uh, those who ask questions to identify themselves because Paul uh, cannot see you all. Um, so uh, raise your hand and uh, Adrian will distribute the mic. So Dan here and then here. Okay. I'm Paul uh, Dan Slash from the Economist Corporate Network. Very interesting presentation. Um, can you just repeat your uh, estimate for the shortfall in the peak months? And can you explain uh, how people will be, how the government will be making a choice between um, industrial usage and household usage? Are we going to is the plan based to sacrifice household usage for industrial usage? When you when you say estimate uh, estimate for what for the the gap the supply demand imbalance or for, for what? Estimate of whether we're going to go through July and August the peak months without um, uh, power shortfalls. Oh, okay. Well. Um, a few months ago, I published a, a paper which gave a, a scenario no analysis worse. Uh, case scenario, base case, and best case scenario, and what that impact would be in terms of the reserve margins. 
<clears throat> it, the base case scenario uh, at the time uh, was looking to be, if I can just go back to it, what would actually happen. Uh, Pepco, strangely enough, has managed to surprise. I think they've kept expectations so low about what could happen um, that uh, they're slowly uh, showing people now uh, that they have managed to get conventional supply on. They're now projecting a, a shortfall of around three gigawatts, I believe, for the uh, July and August summer months. Uh, with a, a three gigawatt uh, uh, imbalance, I think it's safe to say uh, that blackouts will take place. Where will these blackouts happen? I personally think the political pressure is too strong to have these blackouts in the urban areas of Tokyo. I think they will most likely take place in the rural and uh, suburban areas of the Kanto region. Uh, that, of course, is where industrial customers uh, and factories are located the most, and therefore they will be the ones who will be most inconvenienced by the power outages. Uh, how great of an impact that will have depends largely on how much they choose to consume electricity. As you know, the original plan was to have uh, a 25 percent voluntary reduction in electricity consumption uh, during the peak summer months. That's been lowered now to 15 percent. Uh, and it continues to come down, uh, partially because supply has gone up. Uh, but in terms of its GDP impact right now, uh, it's unclear. It all depends on how companies are willing to comply with this uh, shortfall. Uh, next question was here. Mr. Sort of businessman, thank you very much. Uh, my question is about the. Uh, could you could you share us your reaction or, or the market reaction to hear the news which which was announced last week uh, from the uh, Pepco and the government? The news was uh, that uh, meltdowns, couples of meltdowns, uh, occurred two month two months ago, exactly after the earthquake, and uh, they tricked, they lied, and uh, it was okay for Japanese people because Japanese be people became insensitive. But I'm afraid that the holiness, uh, the recognition of the Western societies that the Japanese government and the big company lied and uh, yeah, started yeah. Uh, leaving Japan. So how's their view? Well, I should preface my remarks by saying quite clearly that I am not a nuclear engineer. And therefore, I hesitate to comment on this issue. That said, uh, the market reaction has been uh, surprisingly uh, stable. Uh, the share price, if, if the market believed that uh, <clears throat> the uh, recent revelations of a possible uh, meltdown in reactors two and three took place uh, as a result of the earthquake and was not induced by the tsunami, uh, and that this was somehow going to affect uh, earnings and the viability of the company, you would have seen the share price actually uh, fall even more. Uh, but that really didn't really, that didn't happen very much. Um, there was a one day tr trading period where the share price fell from around 510 yen to as low as about 370. Um, but that was a one off and the, and the share price has since stabilized. Uh, does TEPCO now have an image problem uh, as a liar? Well, TEPCO has had this problem since 2002, uh, when it was first revealed that the company uh, may have engaged in systematic cover-ups of its uh, reactors' uh, maintenance inspections uh, from as far back as 2000, uh, and how METI possibly uh, was complicit in uh, this so-called cover-up. Is it true? Uh, I, I really can't comment on that. I, I don't know. Uh, what, I, what I do know is that uh, the market right now does not seem terribly interested uh, in these sort of issues. What they do care about uh, is blackout risk, bankruptcy risk, uh, managerial efficiency, uh, 
and of course where electricity prices are going moving forward. Uh, yes, here. We'll go to the next question, Paul. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your talk, Stefan Essak from uh, Sangoro. Um, you mentioned the, in terms of supply and demand, the, the limitations uh, either for, for purchasing from uh, other power utilities or for building new, uh, new plants on the, on, on the archipelago. Um, how about uh, uh, the technical or political limitations uh, for connecting the, <coughs> the island to, to the continent? Is it something that's, that's possible? Either Korea or, or, or Russia. The technical and political uh, possibilities of connecting to the Korean Peninsula? Is that the question? Yes, for instance. Is it possible to connect the, the, the Japanese grid to, to the continental grid? Well, um, that's actually a very interesting question. The, uh, the British have connected to the European mainland, uh, and the Italians have connected uh, to the Greek. Uh, Greek across the, the Adriatic and, of course, the European Channel. Uh, I remember asking once uh, the, Europe, the uh, Japanese power companies why they don't bother to connect to Korea, considering that Korean electricity prices are so low. And uh, the answer I received was that, once again, it's a question of who's going to pay for all of it. Kyushu Electric Power Company and Chugoku Electric Power Companies are the ones closest to Korea. They simply did not want to pay. Uh, without government subsidies. And the government showed no interest whatsoever in, uh, in laying uh, 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 high-voltage uh, transmission wires underneath the sea uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, the, to uh, the Korean uh, Peninsula. Uh, it would cost uh, billions and billions of yen. Uh, and uh, the thought that the Ministry of Finance would uh, approve uh, of such funding is also highly debatable. Uh, as you know, the Ministry of Finance has uh, adopted a principle of fiscal balance, uh, either raise taxes or cut expenditures. The objective is to keep expenditures down, not continually fund uh, more projects. So uh, unless a, a case can be made that the uh, cheap electricity from South Korea uh, would ultimately help uh, and not hurt Japan's national uh, power stability, um, I suspect what will happen is there will be just more of the same in action, inertia, and nothing else. Thank you. Yes, here, and then Zeke, thank you. This is again on the regular business side. I have a question about Paul. Thanks for this presentation. I have a question on uh, slide 19, the tariff comparisons. I have three part questions. One is, uh, why is Japan so high? Second, why is Korea so low? Third, in the Korea, it seems like the, the ratio between residential and industrial is much closer than other countries. Why is that the case? Very good question. Um, this was part of, uh, I have a whole chapter devoted to this in my forthcoming book. Um, and it was also part of my doctoral dissertation. Um, it, it's a shame that I, I couldn't include the, the time series chart, which actually broke down electricity prices uh, by component, and you would see very clearly what the problem is. Uh, but in a nutshell, l let, me, let me explain what happened. Um, before 1973, Japan's electricity prices were actually quite low. They were comparable to the rest of the world. And then you had the 1973 Arab-Israeli war and the oil shock. Now, because TEPCO uh, and all the electric power companies had relied predominantly on cheap oil-fired thermal uh, conventional capacity, uh, over 80% to be exact, the oil shock. Um, which essentially was oil prices going up more than 660%, had a huge impact on electricity prices. Uh, the average uh, Japanese electricity tariff, which was comparable to the rest of the world, went from 7.1 yen per kilowatt hour to as high as uh, 20. 
actually it went higher. And the reason was the fuel costs had gone up. Now, the oil price has since then come back down. And uh, as you know, they have changed their, uh, their, uh, their fuel mix. They've, they've, uh, have, they have less oil now, and uh, they have more nuclear uh, and LNG. So why is the price still so high? Fuel costs have come down. This is where it gets fascinating. The increase in the so-called other category, which is a component breakdown, has expanded exponentially since the 1980s, keeping the electricity price basically at the same level as it was back when oil prices started to come back down in 1984. When I would ask the companies, what is in this other category? Um, I remember one uh, back in 2002, one of the... Uh, one of the explanations given to me was, well, this is partially the result of compensation uh, that we have to deal in to local communities that we ultimately pass on to the end user for nuclear power related issues, compensation to fishermen, compensation to farmers, compensation to consumer groups, compensation to uh, the aged, compensation to women um, in order for everyone to basically accept electric power. And I thought that was fascinating, uh, especially when you actually look at the breakdown. And I'm, once again, I have to apologize. I, I chose this one just for, for a, a quick look. I should, have, I should have put the one with the component breakdown. Uh, nuclear power has ironically, ironically contributed to the very thing uh, that they wanted to solve, which was high prices. And yet they were willing to go along with it because it gave them the one thing they always wanted, which was stability uh, and freedom from the oil shocks that you were going to face from the politically unstable Middle East. Now, why is that not the case in the United States and Korea? Well, in the case of Korea, Korea is basically one company. It's KEPCO, Kansa, uh, Korea Electric Power Corporation. It's a monopoly. Uh, over the entire Korean market. Whereas in the case of Japan, you're looking at 10 fiefdoms from Hokkaido all the way down to Okinawa, each with their own service uh, requirements. Uh, one reason is uh, the uh, efficiency levels for Korea are actually higher. Um, the load factors are higher. Um, and uh, and the costs, uh, both for fuel, seem to be lower than the, the costs in the case of, of TEPCO, uh, both for fuel contracts uh, and for uh, uh, the uh, construction costs uh, on their fixed assets. Now, uh, one thing that is clear is that personnel costs are not the reason that Japan's electricity prices are so high. Uh, pers personnel costs are competitive with the rest of the world, uh, and they're a small component of Japan's high electricity prices. And I should state, because this has been floated uh, numerous times, that uh, executive compensation is a fraction of a percent. It's 0.02% of total operating costs. So that has no relation, despite what the Japanese Communist Party insists, has no uh, impact whatsoever on Japanese electricity prices whatsoever. Uh, Japan's prices and problems are effectively first the result of fuel costs and now the result of, of capital costs rising both for nuclear power plants but also uh, for compensation and other issues that stem from that. That's what I believe. Uh, thank you. Siegfried? Siegfried Nino, freelancer from Germany. You said at the end, um, alternative energy options are bleak. But um, it is not only a, a question of uh, political support and political uh, uh, money from the government to, to, uh, to give it to uh, perhaps to um, companies to develop um, wind uh, uh, competitive windmills and uh, competitive uh, sonar cells. 
Um, I think uh, in Germany, in, when Germany developed uh, atomic uh, power plants in the 60s, it happened with, with a lot of uh, with money from, from the government. And only after this, the uh, power plants were uh, competitive. So I think to, to change uh, energy policy to uh, alternative energy, to make it competitive, is only a question of a political decision. Uh, perhaps it, it, there is some kind of um, um, safety question about windmill in the Pacific, because uh, water is deep and, uh, and the typhoon uh, can destroy the windmill. But some weeks after the Fukushima incident, uh, Ichikawa heavy industry came out with a model with two models of windmills who can be based in the Pacific, in, in deep water, and can withstand uh, uh, typhoons. So it means it's only this is only uh, if it, the, the uh, industry is industry necessary for an industry to develop this kind of uh, machineries. They can do it. It's a it's a political question to uh, to opt for this kind of uh, alternative energy. I think. Well, uh, thank you for your question and your comment. Uh, I I hear this quite often. <clears throat> that uh, uh, foreign countries have done so well in terms of renewable energy uh, added to their portfolio of energy that Japan could easily join. Uh, if Iceland can do so well in terms of geothermal power, why can't Japan? If Germany can do so well with solar, why can't Japan? If Denmark can do so well with wind, why can't Japan. And uh, I, I think it's a very legitimate question to ask, uh, is this a political question or is this an economic slash technological question? Now, the utility companies, perhaps not surprisingly in Japan, argue that it is an economic slash technological issue for Japan, whereas the anti-nuclear lobby argues, no, it is strictly a political question because the utility companies stand to lose money if they, uh, after making such large sunk and fixed costs into nuclear power, have to switch now to something which uh, is perhaps even more expensive uh, and not as reliable. Keep in mind, uh, and I'm sure uh, some people in the audience know this already, the reason nuclear power was so successful back in the 1970s in the wake of the oil crisis was not because of some evil cabal which forced it on to the Japanese people. The reason it actually worked so successfully was because it provided the three things that the electorate, politicians, uh, and industry wanted, which was namely what you see in the graph. The generation costs were low compared to thermal power and hydro, or re relatively low, I should say. Second. Um, they were environmentally friendly, and that's what people wanted. The carbon dioxide emissions and carbon footprint was lower, and that's good. The third thing was that it provided a stable source of what we call in the industry a base load supply. In other words, it runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 30 days a month. Uh, it is efficient in terms of overall cost. In other words, uh, if you had just one power plant and you had a fixed line depreciation schedule, the actual cost of the power plant would decline over time. That was the theory. They never figured on compensation issues getting in the way, but that was the original generation cost theory of why people wanted nuclear power, uh, especially in light of what the uh, you had to deal with thermal. Now the issue is, well, Yes, renewables are more expensive, but you know they also serve multiple needs. I, I honestly think that even though the generation costs for solar and for wind uh, and geothermal are coming down, um, the transmission and distribution costs don't come down. Uh, and for the end user, it's pretty much the same issue over time. The electricity prices still have to go up. And industry has been very clear on this. They don't want their electricity prices going up any further. They're high enough as they are. Do we have to raise them even more as a result of a feed-in tariff uh, in order to subsidize an industry to become more competitive? 
then the utility companies counter argue that the bigger problem is Japan's topography, Japan's geographical structure. Unlike in Denmark and Germany, where the wind is actually quite uh, conducive to windmill farms, uh, in the Sea of Japan, it's questionable. I am not a, a, a renewable engineer for alternative energy sources, uh, but I have spoken to enough uh, engineers on this matter to know that there are legitimate questions as to whether or not uh, it can provide enough stable power uh, at an affordable price, which is ultimately the biggest contradiction in this entire discussion. We as consumers want it all, don't we? We want an unlimited supply of power. We want it 24 hours a day. We don't want the lights to go out. We want it cheap and we want it now. And we, on top of that, we want something that's environmentally friendly. This is incredibly difficult. Not everyone can be satisfied. Some people have to be compensated. Other people have to make difficult decisions that hurt others. In the course of this entire discussion, there is going to be a change, I am sure. Uh, are we going to have such a radical change now uh, to renewable energies shifting over from nuclear power? To be perfectly honest, I am highly skeptical that this is actually going to happen. Because basically, for the most important reason of all, because we're talking about Japan. We're talking about a country where change does not happen overnight. Everything happens in committee. It is studied to death. The Japanese word for it is kangai sugi, meaning overthink. And they will look at data from around the world, and they will look at it over and over and over again until finally they decide that maybe nothing will be done at all. I strongly suspect that is what we faced in 2009 when the DPJ came to office, and it turned out to be largely correct. And I strongly suspect that it will repeat itself again here for the alternative energy versus nuclear energy issue. Once again, inertia probably will take hold. Paul, we're a university. We never believe that things are overstudied and over-researched. <laughs> uh, uh, David in the back, and then Claude the back. Thank you very much for the presentation, Paul. Uh, quick, quick question, if you could introduce um, yourself. Oh, David Abraham at the uh, at Tokyo University. Um, oh, David, how are you doing? <laughs> good to see you. The uh, question about the, stat the, the, the current status. Um, is the capacity now able to, eat, to meet demand? And um, if so, um, why are there the need for um, a demand reduction strategy at this well, point? Uh, yes. Well, yes. Well, currently, there's no blackouts, obviously, because demand is under control. Uh, that's 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 the simplest explanation I can give to you, uh, which seems fairly obvious. Uh, the the real issue is the summer when everyone turns on their air conditioners and electricity actually goes up. The demand peak demand will go up, uh, and we're relying almost entirely on TEPCO's forecasts. Uh, TEPCO says, and I I don't see them having any real reason to lie, they might try to control expectations. If they can keep expectations low and then deliver uh, without blackouts taking place, that will be a huge political bonus for the company and for the current government. So I suspect that's part of the reason why uh, they're very cautious on saying don't panic. Uh, they want to keep expectations low, so when they actually come forward and, uh, and bring supply on, uh, it's a political benefit to them. Um, so right now, because we're in the middle of June, well, not we're in the middle of the end of May, actually, um, it's not really hot and humid yet. Um, and they're trying to bring on supply from uh, self-generators, Jika Hatsuden, and uh, as well as uh, uh, raising load factors uh, and capacities of existing power plants. But there's only so much you can do. That sort of answer your question? Uh, let me just follow up because I have the mic and no one else has raised their hand at the moment. No, people but, have raised their hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me yeah. follow up real quickly. Sure. Um, Quick. But there are, there are a number of demand uh, reduction strategies now. Certain offices aren't using elevators, lights, um, air conditioners. Right. Is that, is that yeah. necessary? Is it necessary? Yes. Yes. Um, without it, it certainly, it certainly doesn't hurt. Um, the... Um, 
the residential customers are about 40% of TEPCO's uh, kilowatt hours sold. Uh, the rest is commercial and industrial. Uh, the con administration, con cabinet, uh, has initially targeted the industries, saying, and the commercial users, saying, you, you're the ones that have to lower your, your electricity usage, knowing full well that it's going to hurt GDP in the next couple of quarters. Uh, but they've also put out these uh, extended uh, advertisements to, to uh, residential customers to comply as well. Um, they're trying to use uh, a variety of off-grid methods, including solar power panels to, to roofs um, and using smart grid, uh, suggesting the usage of smart grid system, as well as advocating uh, a new type of air conditioner, uh, which actually is, is, a, is a fascinating technology produced by Panasonic Corporation which can tell you exactly what the humidity is in your room and how hot it is and whether or not uh, the electric, uh, uh, the air conditioner should turn itself on or not. This is a, a great power saver. Uh, and uh, you should probably see Panasonic Corporation doing quite well in the coming months as they, as they sell more of these, uh, these and similar devices. Uh, it certainly doesn't hurt their businesses. Um, it might inconvenience slightly uh, the residential customers, but uh, I, I do believe that uh, it is necessary to ask for reductions uh, from from consumers, both residential and industrial, if we're to avoid blackouts. Yes. Uh, that, yes, you have the mic. Thank you, Paul, for your presentation. This is all uh, pretty new information to me, but um, since you brought up... If you could introduce yourself. Uh, yes, my name is Irene Hara, and I work here at Temple University. I'm a professor here. Um, so I was wondering, since you brought up the others category compensations, you talked about the minimal risk of bankruptcy and so on. Um, is are we expecting compensation towards workers or people in the affected area? To are they going? Are we expecting that they will demand for compensation to TEPCO, and will this affect TEPCO's numbers at all? Will it affect its uh, personnel costs? Was that the question? It will affect, will affect TEPCO in general, you, because we talked about the fact that they will have to, um, you spoke about the fact that they will have to, they will have to ask for greater loans and this and that. How, how yeah, will yeah. Oh, Without a doubt, yes, absolutely. Um, there, there, there's no doubt that uh, um, these types of categories are called extraordinary losses. Every time, every time something that does not happen in the ordinary, uh, the ordinary, uh, 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 daily operations uh, will uh, affect the company uh, bottom line. Uh, if the question, if your question is, will uh, wages have to go up and other forms of compensation for the workers, uh, I suspect the answer is yes. Uh, both in nominal and real terms, uh, wages will most likely go up. Uh, but right now, for uh, the short term, it's actually the reverse. What's happening right now is uh, the company has asked its employees to take a voluntary reduction of about 20, I think for the lower management uh, and administrative staff, it's somewhere along 15 to 20 percent, um, if memory serves. And for uh, the top executive management, uh, especially the chairman and the president, uh, they're giving back virtually all of their compensation. Uh, for fiscal year 2011 and probably fiscal year 2012, we don't know yet. Uh, and then for the mid-level management, uh, they're looking at a 50% roughly reduction in um, their uh, their wages uh, over the next year as a sort of atonement uh, for the crisis. It's sort of a Japanese way of saying we're sorry, we're we're going to suffer with you. Uh, don't expect that to last though. Um, I, I suspect that within the next few years uh, they will be back to normal, if not sooner, uh, and of course continue their upward trend. But um, how much that affects electricity prices overall, uh, as, I, as I mentioned uh, in the presentation, personnel costs as a percentage of the electricity price is less than 15 percent. In fact, it's, it's less than that. Um, and uh, it's, it's been rising only slightly. So um, the real issue is not personnel costs for the electricity prices, it's uh, capital costs and fuel costs. 
And thank you for uh, Sato san. A Sato, small business owner and investor. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, it's been just fascinating to know that one time what I believe to be true turned to be entirely wrong. And this situation I see is quite similar to what we experienced just after World War II. By two months, Japanese awakened to see the reality, and then GHQ is a sort of leading factor to enlighten the new era. Now, we need a juice like the GHQ, who tells one time to be the truth, and reading the Japanese to us the difficult errors, and when it's necessary, we need money. So money can be supplied by IMF or World Bank or whoever, because Japan itself is in a serious difficulty of managing ourselves from the beginning, just before 3.11. We are under the deflationary economy, and people are now talking about the trillion dollars economy to just for nothing to compensate or to cure and the poverty. So I see one thing that I should like to know at this stage is the stability of uranium cost. You mentioned about the fuel cost, but what about right. uranium, the scarcity, all these details, man. but I focused on the uranium cost, please, at this stage. Thank you. Very good question. Um, uranium costs uh, are actually quite low. Um, I think you're absolutely right to focus on that. It's something of a contradiction, isn't it? Uh, that when we discuss the uh, oil shock of 1973 and 1979 as a rationale for uh, switching to nuclear power and uh, getting off imported fossil fuels, um, that uh, people tend to overlook the fact that Japan must also import uranium. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, uh, the difference, uh, as I understand it, uh, has been that the uranium costs are locked in by contract uh, that are longer in time and duration than in the case of uh, fossil fuels, like LNG and oil, where they are one-year uh, renewable contracts um, that have the option to be renewed sooner, uh, whereas uranium is not the case. Uh, that's the first point. Uh, the second point is uh, I personally do not follow the uh, price of uranium. There's a publication called uh, Nuclear Intelligence Weekly, which uh, I was happy to learn follows the, uh, the cost of uranium quite religiously <laughs> uh, to see where prices are going. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just wrote a piece for them that, that will be published next week uh, on uh, on power issues, but uh, I uh, would have to get back to you with the exact costs for uranium as a total percentage of Japan's nuclear generation costs. To be perfectly honest, I don't I don't have those figures readily available in my head right now, uh, and I, I wouldn't want to uh, uh, just pick something out of the air for you. But uh, to uh, address the last question, the issue of uh, uh, external monitoring and the, the, the IMF. Uh, I, I hear this all the more often, and uh, the reply has always been the same. Uh, national sovereignty is the issue. Um, does Japan have to uh, give up its sovereignty uh, and its regulatory authority to outsiders uh, simply because they say so? Um, do the French do this? Do the Americans do this? And actually, it's quite an interesting question. Would, would, American, would America ever surrender its sovereignty to outside third parties if it weren't in America's national interest? Uh, and after giving this a little bit of thought, I, I'm very skeptical that it would happen. Uh, the national, international courts, uh, they've been trying to get America to sign international courts now for ages to become part of the, the international tribunals, and America has been very hesitant uh, because they're afraid what would happen if they started to try uh, American soldiers in international courts. Um, now, obviously, this is a different situation when it comes to nuclear power issue, 
um, but the issue of sovereignty remains. Uh, and I suspect strongly that if uh, other countries, and I do mean there's over 190 countries on, on this planet, were to fall in line and do so, uh, the Japanese would as well. Uh, but right now, it's a large question mark as to whether or not uh, this would ever happen. Yes, uh, in the back. Maybe in the back right here. If you can keep your uh, questions fairly brief, because we don't have much time left. Uh, I work for an international organization. Uh, following up uh, uh, on the question on the cost of uh, um, uranium, uh, I wonder if you can say something about uh, the cost of um, uh, dealing with the spent nuclear fuel. I think we've heard uh, uh, quite often recently uh, that comparing the uh, um, uh, cost of um, producing electricity with the uh, nuclear uh, power and uh, other means, uh, in case of nuclear power, uh, the cost for dealing with spent fuel is not included. So can you say something about that point? Uh, yes. Uh, the utility companies uh, consider it a liability. It is a liability that is provided for and provisioned for on their balance sheets. Uh, this is uh, included uh, as part of the electricity tariff, which uh, uh, is part of the cost. Uh, and it is slowly uh, added as a provision over time. But it is, it is most definitely a liability. Uh, the second question is, uh, what do they do with it? Uh, originally, there were two companies which dealt with the reprocessing of nuclear fuel. One was a French company, the other was a British company. Um, then there was the issue of what will happen if Japan were to have its own uh, facilities domestically. Uh, and that's why uh, they've tried now in Aomori Prefecture for at least the past 10 years to have the reprocessing, uh, re reprocessing facility uh, uh, work. But there are political problems involved. Um, yes, it's true. Uh, I get this question quite often. Uh, when we look at the generation cost, uh, if you go back, you see this blue line here. Uh, people often ask, is reprocessing of irradiated fuel and the decommissioning uh, of the uh, power co the companies, nuclear power plants included in the uh, price of uh, uh, generation. Uh, and uh, as far as I know from speaking with the companies, the answer is no, it's not. Uh, I'd have to go back. Uh, in fact, I'm having another uh, interview with them uh, within the next two weeks. And I'm one of the large topics of uh, discussion will be this very issue. Um, exactly when does it, uh, when is it included and when is it not included and why? Uh, and how does that contribute to the overall price? Uh, so right now, I can't give any definitive answer uh, on how it impacts the, the generation cost. Thank you. Uh, Yoshikawa-san? Uh, Yuki Yoshikawa at Accenture. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, and I have two questions. Uh, one is about the, you have mentioned that the Japanese um, the, the, um, the, between East and West, the uh, volume of the electricity is different, and I was wondering like, how they can um, del deliver between each other, and I have not heard like the, the reason they cannot do it because like the TEPCO is in bad terms with the Kansai Singapore, and I'm not sure it's true or not, so if you could clarify that. And the second question is, what can um, TEPCO learn from this um, event, like from, the, you can, I, I'm sure like you can point many problems, like starting from the, uh, the hiding the packs or the, uh, the brownout and they were total in a mess and um, so, uh, but out of the many problems, what do you say that is the most important people should learn if it's going to survive as you put it? Uh, thanks. Yeah, that's a, that's uh, also a very good question. Let, let me let me deal with the second questions first. Uh, what can TEPCO learn from these events? 
Well, I, I think there's basically three things uh, that TEPCO can learn. <clears throat> the first, I, I hesitate to discuss because I'm not a nuclear engineer, but I think it's safe to say that um, the, the issues of, of uh, earthquake resistance and tsunami resistance to all of its power plants, not only the, the 17 reactors that TEPCO has, but also around Japan as a whole, uh, need to be revisited. Unlike in France, where you notice that nuclear power plants are located within the, within the country, in Japan, they're all located around the literal of the country, the, the coastline, uh, as a result of uh, uh, gaining access to seawater and then in, in the off chance you need to cool the power plants, uh, among other things, uh, including the topography of Japan, 75% being mountainous. It's very difficult to find exact spot on where to put the power plant. But those are two of the main reasons. Um, so the first, uh, the first thing that TEPCO can learn is uh, what to deal, what to do uh, in terms of their security, uh, earthquake and tsunami measures. And I'm sure engineers will be revisiting and debating this now for decades to come. Second thing I would uh, mention uh, is that the whole issue of Japan's national energy policy in general and, and whether or not Japan will, uh, could, and should stay with uh, its targets for uh, power. And uh, I'm not quite sure, I, as I mentioned before, I'm quite skeptical, I should say, um, that much will change on this front, but I am, I am sure they will revisit it, uh, including the available evidence, uh, in order to make an informed decision on uh, the economic and technical outputs uh, that's try to simultaneously juggle multiple objectives, including environmental costs and, and uh, national stability of power supply, and of course, the cost of power itself. And the third and probably most important thing that I think TEPCO, and, and probably all of us will learn from all of this, was just the media reaction. I, I don't think I'm alone in being impressed with how calm most people were uh, in the wake of, of not only uh, the terrible and tragic earthquake, but also the nuclear crisis itself compared to the media coverage in the West. Uh, here in the United States, uh, I watched uh, MSNBC, CNN, uh, ABC, uh, I read the newspapers, and I, I, I was actually terrified <laughs> because the impressions that if you watched on the American coverage uh, of MSNBC, for example, you would think that Japan was going to explode any minute now, and we were all going to die, and radioactive zombies were going to be eating our children for the next 300 years. That's the, that's the image that MSNBC constantly projected. And then you turn on NH, NHK News, and it's very staid and calm and collected and professional with charts and graphs and analytics and everything is 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 very is very uh, professionally calm and well done. Is this one of the reasons why the Japanese electorate and the average Japanese person was so calm in the midst of all this? Because the coverage uh, in the Japanese media was so restrained. I strongly suspect that people uh, moving forward will be examining this in much detail in order to see if not only uh, the power companies can learn something from this, uh, but also the world on the reactions from people. And then the first question was on the east-west frequency mismatch. Um, how can they change? Uh, and what do they do? Well. Uh, as you know, this problem has been with Japan since the 19th century. Uh, it started by pure accident. It was an accident of history. Uh, they imported their technology. Uh, one company imported it, their technology from the United States. The other company imported their technology from Germany. Uh, both the United States and Germany have two different Hertz systems. And because the regulatory environment was fairly non-existent until 1911, uh, by the time there were regulations in place, 
um, the network system was already up and running. So there wasn't much you can do unless you tore the whole network system down. So Japan has something that is fairly unique to their uh, vertically integrated accounts that you don't see anywhere else in the world. And that's what they call in Japanese henden. Henden is the transformation accounts, right? Uh, they are transformers. Uh, and the henden are everywhere uh, on the borders of each of the 10 power, well, the nine power company uh, service regions. Unfortunately, it costs too much to transfer power uh, to two different Hertz systems, even though you can technically do it. So they largely stay within their, their regions. The 50 Hertz and 60 Hertz systems can exchange power back and forth easily. Um, and uh, that was something of a disappointment to see that the 2005 pooling system, uh, which started to, it was intended to sort of um, imitate the UK pooling system, uh, and its grid didn't really take off very well. And part of the reason was the frequency mismatch, uh, which sadly, unless both the utility companies and the government agree that we're going to tear down the entire network system and build a new one from Okinawa all the way to Hokkaido, um, we're stuck with the system we have forever. Uh, and of course, METI did do a study uh, in 2000 when they were liberalizing. Actually, they did the study in 1999 and they, they started by approaching the power companies. They wanted to they wanted to know if the power companies would be willing to tear down their networks and rebuild them. And when TEPCO got off the floor from laughing so hard, um, they said, do you have any idea how much it would cost to replace an entire network system? You know how many billions of dollars are involved? Uh, it's just not practical. It's just not going to happen. Uh, and therefore, unless the government was going to pay for it, and even if the government agreed to pay for it, the issue of, once again, power stability and the entire practical logistics involved of actually attempting uh, to keep GDP uh, afloat and the economy afloat while trying to replace this over time is just such a monumental, monumental undertaking. I strongly doubt it will ever happen. Um, so... Expect more of the same, once again, sadly, for the 50 and 60 hertz systems moving forward. Uh, Paul, let, Paul, Paul, let me take the advantage of sharing this as a last question. You mentioned that the Japanese media was restrained. Is it restrained or self-censorship? Because when we read what Japanese journalists working for foreign organizations were writing, the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, New York Times, uh, the wire services, uh, they were much more critical, and when you talk to perfectly reasonable, non-hysterical individuals, both in the week after uh, the tsunami and uh, right now, that now we, that we know a lot more, uh, the impression you get is that maybe we're talking about self-censorship or accepting at face value what clearly were, uh, if not lies, at least uh, truth economizing statements uh, from TEPCO. Yeah, uh, you know, this, I, I get this question too. Um, I, uh, I hesitate to comment on this because usually this discussion goes in one of two directions. One direction is that they're quiet because they're being paid off. <laughs> this is what we're told. Uh, TEPCO has power over them somehow, magically. Uh, and therefore, the journalists uh, all cower in the corners and they're afraid that the mighty TEPCO will crush them if, um, if they write anything negative about the company. That's one line of thought. I find it very dubious. Uh, the other line of thought is that they self-censor themselves uh, simply because of uh, the need to confirm, and reconfirm, uh, and reconfirm yet again anything that could be considered so controversial that it leads to national panic. Does anyone really want national panic in the room? I doubt it. Uh, and yet, I think it's very fair to say that if you were watching MSNBC, you were panicking. In fact, uh, I was reading a, a Japan Times article the other day uh, written by uh, someone who wanted to justify why he fled Japan. And uh, he argued that he fled Japan because of the inordinate amount of family pressure coming from the United States all of which was the result of watching uh, U.S. cable news networks and their coverage of, 
of oh, the uh, crisis. I'm talking about entertainment uh, channels. <laughs> like, yeah. so what I'm talking about is things like the Wall Street Journal, the FT, uh, the New York Times. I mean, journalists you and I know who were indeed far more concerned and were not sensationalizing the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, well, <laughs> you can take the Fifth Amendment if you want. <laughs> I, 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 I don't really want to comment on the New York Times uh, and the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times uh, uh, simply because I don't want to incur their wrath. So, um, I, but uh, no, but in all seriousness, I. Uh, uh, people have written academic studies on the Japanese media trying to make sense of it all. And uh, I don't think there's any one simple independent variable that explains everything. Uh, I do think that it will be continued to be studied, but uh, beyond what I've already said, I, I don't know if there's any s simple explanation as to why the Japanese uh, coverage is so remarkably uh, different than the, the American coverage of the of both the nuclear crisis and the earthquake. I really don't know. But I think it's a fascinating question. Uh, and I have no doubt whatsoever that it will be studied. Well, thank you very much, Paul. We're extremely grateful uh, to Temple University. <laughs> In the morning, so we'd like to thank everybody in the, in the TU studio uh, out in Philadelphia. We'd like to thank all the su computer support staff here in uh, Tokyo, and of course, we'd like to thank you, Paul. Uh, thanks again, and uh, we hope to see you again uh, in person in Tokyo. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'll be back in uh, I'll be back in uh, October. So uh, I'll be uh, working at the University of Tokyo. So uh, I hope to see most of you uh, again very soon. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Paul. See you, see you soon in New York. Uh, thank, you, thank you all uh, for coming. If any of you have questions or comments about how this went, if you have ideas on how to improve it, uh, we hope to continue to do these uh, video links, which allow us to have speakers uh, from other parts of the world. Uh, so let, let us know if you have comments on how it went, the audio, the video. Uh, any suggestions are welcome because we'd like uh, to continuously improve this system. So thanks again. Thank you all. Uh, you know, one time I interviewed a journalist, I was, um, you know, why news were the way, and most of them would say to me, we don't want to be responsible for breaking the wall. Thanks, guys. We're signing off. Yeah, yeah. Okay, take care. <laughs> okay, thank you. If I... Thank you. Thanks. That was really well done. Just uh, email me. Okay. Alrighty. Thanks, Paul. Uh, it's my pleasure.